The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by CNMC, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat Commission. Com. I am back here today with another Wheat School episode, and I have here with me Tyler Wist, who's a field crop entomologist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon. How's it going today? It's going well. How are you doing today, Kara? I am doing great. Now, uh, we are going to talk about an insect that you have spent a lot of time researching on. I know it is uh, one of the top ones on your list, probably. It is wheat midge. It is, uh, I've seen some of the forecasts across the prairies. Looks like it could be kind of a tricky year for wheat midge. Do you have any comments on that? It could be a tricky year for wheat midge. I like the way you put that. So, uh, every year, the the province and uh, and Sask Wheat in Saskatchewan and uh, you know the other wheat commodity groups in the other provinces, um, they go out and they take, sh- I wouldn't say sh- yeah shovelfuls. Let's call it shovelfuls. They take uh, scoops of dirt from the field and they look for wheat midge overwintering cocoons. And then they make a wheat midge forecast. And so the forecast for the last few years has been pretty low. Let's use green as the color that keeps showing up. But this year there was a lot of red showing up. And so conditions have been conducive to wheat midge population increases. And so wheat midge, though, is really tied to spring weather. So everything I know about wheat midge is based on the work of scientists before me at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And... uh, What they taught us about wheat midge is that we need about 25 millimeters of rain in the spring to get those overwintering wheat midge cocoons to develop into adults that will coincide with the the spring wheat. And so the same rain that gets the spring wheat out of the ground also gets the wheat midge out of the ground. About the last week in June is when the wheat midge starts to come out. So if you're out there scouting, um, you need to be out there at dawn or dusk. Eight o'clock is a good time because you can still see and the wheat midge start to come out. So you're looking for a calm evening with uh, not a whole lot of wind and some decent humidity. And those wheat midge come up out of the canopy and the females start looking around for places on the heads to lay eggs. And so what you're looking for there is look at about 10 heads. And if you see one wheat midge on those 10 heads, that is your grade threshold. If you're looking at one wheat midge on about five heads, that's your yield threshold. So one wheat midge on five heads right there is about a 15% yield loss. And so that's our economic threshold for wheat midge. So other ways that you can look for the midge besides just, you know, staring blankly at at some heads in a field is you can use a yellow sticky card. You can use a pheromone trap and uh, that's what we do. Um, the pheromone traps, you have to order those, so not everybody has one. But I know that Scott Mears, when he talks about scouting for wheat midge, he takes a pie plate and he sprays it with some uh, vegetable oil spray. And he just whacks that through the canopy. And if you get these little orange flies on it, you can say, ah, the wheat midge have come out and they're here in my field. And then you can go to your your economic threshold method of just standing there looking for them. Because you don't want to just stand there looking for them if they're not really out in your field yet. So it is detect them and then detect your economic threshold. Well, and of course, you're, you're not seeing them yet. But you want to talk about the importance of setting those traps out and kind of being ahead of the game if you can. Because wheat midge can get out of control, correct? They can, yeah. You don't need to worry about wheat midge, though, until your wheat is starting to head. So you get that boot, and as soon as the boot splits, that's the danger zone for wheat midge. So we're looking Zadok stage about 50 to 60. Uh, Because as soon as, well, about halfway through anthesis, the wheat midge heads, or the wheat heads become more resistant to the wheat midge, and they really don't do very well on them. So some of Bob Elliott and Owen Olfert's earlier work showed that the survival of the wheat midge on kind of post anthesis wheat is just way down there. And environmental conditions, what what is the wheat midge like? Wheat midge likes it wet. So 25 millimeters of rain through the spring, which can come in one big dump or it can come in a few smaller ones. And that's what it needs to get going. It'll like moisture through the uh, 
through the growing season too. So if it gets too dry later on, I think they can die up in the heads and not make it down to the ground. And so they actually need a little bit of moisture. So those August thunder showers that go through, the third instar wheat midge just sit around in the heads all quiescent and waiting until that moisture comes along and then they drop down and they use that wet earth to burrow down into and that's where they make their overwintering cocoons so they're really tied to moisture so under wetter conditions that's that's when we get wheat midge now as an entomologist you uh of course are going to be studying beneficial insects as well is there any really known beneficial insects for wheat midge there's one really good beneficial insect and it introduced itself along with the wheat midge. And so it is a little black parasitic wasp called Macroglenes penetrans and it will go after the wheat midge eggs and early instar larvae. And so how it functions is it comes along and it stings that egg or that first instar larva and then it stays inside the body of the wheat midge all the way through the winter until you get a the overwintering cocoon and it starts to develop instead of getting a wheat midge adult that comes out so instead of getting an orange fly coming out of the ground you get a little black wasp coming out of the ground so it actually reduces next year's population of wheat midge and they typically do about 30 percent damage to the population of wheat midge now alberta in their survey um, and saskatchewan their survey too they actually pop open the wheat midge overwintering larvae and they look for the percentage of them that are parasitized. So <laughs> they squeeze them open with needles and out pops a little parasitoid larva and they will actually say, okay, that larva was parasitized so it is not viable and it's not going into the predictions for next year. So Alberta's percent parasitism had dropped to about 8%, which is which is not great for uh, population control. So we checked our Saskatchewan numbers, and the Saskatchewan numbers are still holding steady at about 30% parasitism. But then down in, in uh, North Dakota, they also have wheat midge issues, and they reported low levels of parasitism as well. And so what could be happening is you just have low levels of wheat midge because it's been dry, and we've got midge tolerant wheat now also killing them and so maybe the parasitoid population is just dropping because of that who knows um this is big picture stuff like we need years and years of data to totally understand what's going on in these situations there are a couple of other uh, more minor parasitoids but they were actually introduced from Europe. So they did classical biological control, uh, I think back in the 1990s, and they found two parasitoids there that they introduced to Langenberg, Saskatchewan back in the 90s. And uh, they, don't, they don't synchronize very well with the wheat midge in Saskatchewan. So they haven't really taken off like Macroglenes has. And so the, uh, the primary parasitoid, that Macroglenes penetrans, it comes out of the ground five days after the wheat midge adults do and so it is right there when they've got eggs and larvae and so the wheat midge is well synchronized with spring wheat and macroglenes panatrans is well synchronized with the uh with uh, wheat midge so a couple of other things that could be eating wheat midge we've got ground beetles running around on the ground and when those wheat midge um, larvae come up to the surface to pupate to become adults they can get picked off by things like ground beetles running around as well let's say you've hit that economic threshold you don't have midge tolerant wheat in the field what can you do they've just deregistered chlorpyrifos so you can't use that in your toolbox so you've got dimethoate left to spray and if you're going to be spraying as soon as you hit that economic threshold you should have your sprayer sort of in the background just running ready to go because if you wait too long the wheat midge adults only live five days so if you wait around for a day or two the adults are just going to naturally die and they'll have done all the damage that they're going to do and if you wait even longer than say five days then out come those macroglanes penetrans and you're now spraying the beneficial wasp instead of spraying the adult uh, 
wheat midge. So, yeah, timing is very important with this creature. And unfortunately, it is timed to be bad right about the time that you want to be at the lake on the July long weekend. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll get updates on it. Thank you very much for your time, Tyler. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Kara.